College Football Saturdays in the Southeastern Conference is a rite of passage and some may even say a cherished tradition. Therefore, SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey needed to pull all of the levers at his disposal and turn over every stone in order to ensure he did all he could to kick off a season which resembled as normal as possible, and it appears that Sankey, the coaches, and the rest of the conference officials have accomplished their goal. The SEC is still planning on playing a full season, and that's good news for our friends down south. Daryl Puckett is a weekend sports anchor and reporter for the Alabama News Network. And he took some time out of his busy schedule to join me this week to discuss what the return to college football means for the Southeastern Conference, its fans, and the overall morale of the country. I'm Kevin McShann. Let's have this conversation. Daryl, we'll welcome you to the program, and we're excited to talk a little SEC football with you this morning. So great to see you. See you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank you. I'm uh, super excited to uh, talk some college football with you. So I don't have to tell you, Daryl, that uh, SEC football is king in the Southeastern Conference and in the South where you are. So I'm just wondering if you could begin by telling me what was the initial uh, impression or thoughts on the ground for SEC football fans when the virus first hit as it related to whether they were going to have football or not? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's pretty simple. Is that nobody really expected six, seven months ago that – you know, we would actually get to the summer portion and, you know, kind of push towards a fall and and actually have a question mark as if football was going to actually happen, you know, at least in the state of Alabama. I mean, high school uh, was kind of thrown up there. I mean, the spring championships were postponed. Spring football for SEC was uh, just canceled. I mean, you know, they kept pushing it off, pushing it off, and then eventually – um, you know, they just canceled with it. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe about three months ago is when the uh, SEC athletic directors, um, Alan Green um, and Greg Byrne for Auburn, Alabama, really came out and started taking more of a leadership role when it comes to, um, you know, trying to give a future for what this could look like. And, you know, again, I mean, the questions really just kept – you know, staying in there, is this actually going to happen or is it not going to happen? And so, um, you know, I think from a fan base, because the Auburn, Alabama fan base is just so, so passionate. Um, I mean, you know, for for someone like you that's never, um, probably really never been in it other than, you know, your ties to the Big Ten and kind of Michigan, Ohio State, stuff like that, the Auburn, Alabama fan base were just losing their minds. I mean, absolutely – going nuts over social media because it means so much to the state, just not from a perspective of, you know, competition and uh, playing football and just having fun like that, but just from a revenue standpoint for the state of Alabama, I mean, it is a giant pushing force. Um, I mean, Alabama is one of the few schools in the entire country that actually uh, comes out in the green every year for just the entire athletic department. And that's primarily because of Nick Saban and the Alabama football team. And, you, I mean, just for both sides looking at it, I don't think anybody in the country, anybody that's on the 
a news side uh, covering sports for television stations, for uh, national networks, really had an answer. Um, you, you know, Kevin, I think it was simple. If you look at these guys on the SEC network, uh, Peter Burns, who's a friend of mine, uh, you know, he hosts a bunch of stuff on the SEC network, um, you know, kind of thrown up there. I mean, th these guys had to be pushed to doing styles of interviews like this through Zoom, through their professional work, because they just had no timetable, had no idea. Um, but, you know, just to answer your question real, you know, real quick, just to come back to it. I mean, the passion for football in the state of Alabama from a prep level all the way up to college, I mean, it is great, and it means a lot to the people of the state. And I'm wondering from a recruiting standpoint how – uh, not having a traditional high school football season may affect um, uh, recruiting and the way that goes forward uh, this season. Yeah, you know, I, I think from a recruiting standpoint, um, you know, as, especially if you look at the top two or three teams. I mean, Auburn with Gus Miles on has proved, and, you know, I think in the time of at least all the criticism that Auburn fans have had about Gus Malzahn is that this guy's the only coach in the history of Auburn University that has consistently kept this program in a top 10 tier for recruiting. So, I mean, if you look at that standpoint, that's incredible. I mean, say what you want about the guy losing some of the big games towards the end of the year a couple of years ago, SEC championship, had a chance to get to – um, you know, the college football playoff lost to Georgia in that. Um, so, yeah, if you look at Auburn from a whole, a top 10 program, you look at them right now, they're currently floating around eight or nine. Um, but, but for Alabama, I mean, you're talking about a program with Nick Saban and, um, and just the coaches that they've had in the past and current that have been so good recruiting. That was definitely a question um, from my perspective, getting out there and covering these kids. Um, I mean, I covered – Henry Ruggs III when he was in high school. I mean, I covered him for three seasons. So, you know, covering guys like that are so talented um, out of the state of Alabama to stay in Alabama and um, go to a state university have been so big. And so, again, I, I think it was another question mark. I think the past month, especially the past three weeks, Saban has proved again, hey, you know, I, even though I'm 68 years old, I'm still the top in recruiting. And so – Throughout the process, I think it was kind of a lag, but once the SEC came out and said, look, you know, if you opt out, right, even if you're an incoming freshman, if you opt out, then your scholarship is going to still be recognized. So you can still go to school. You can still have an education. You can still train at whatever guidelines that we would actually have for you at that time. So, um, you know, I think especially the past month, we've seen that recruiting um, has picked up. Um, it has been one of those constant uh, things that for, for sports fans of your college football teams, you have seen consistent recruiting news and sports talk throughout this entire pandemic, which has been enlightening, um, you, you know, especially for sports fans looking for content to read and to ingest and, um, the, you know, just to really have fun with. So, I mean, recruiting, in my opinion, has really kind of saved, uh, you know, um, at least guys like me that do this for a living um, has really saved us for content perspective. And sanity, I'm sure not. <laughs> and can you also tell me, uh, I'm wondering if you can provide some perspective on sort of the mixed messaging and leadership in terms of how different uh, conferences and college presidents and athletic directors are approaching this uh, depending on what uh, part of the country they're in. Because if you're in the Big Ten country, certainly they have a different set of objectives than you do in the South. So I'm just wondering if you can counter oppose how uh, the different uh, approaches have been to the, this whole uh, situation. Yeah, you know, um, it's kind of funny because when you look at it and you start looking at the perspective that it's always, it's always this persona of like the SEC leads and everything. And, um, you know, I mean, even when it comes down to this pandemic, I think you've seen that uh, the leadership that Greg Sankey has had for the entire conference has been 
paramount. I mean, I, I, you know, not to look bad about these other conferences, but I think from my perspective, looking at the leadership level and what Greg Sankey and the SEC has done, because, you know, they didn't act too quick. They took their time. Uh, Sankey let the um, SEC athletic directors for each uh, university really kind of uh, take a giant leadership role when trying to restrict guidelines, trying to get even students back on campus to try to maintain the social distancing, the mask orders uh, that's currently in the state of Alabama. So for, I think from a leadership perspective, um, and then especially when you look at uh, a week ago, you know, I mean, look at the first college football game. It was Austin P in Central Arkansas actually played in Montgomery, Alabama at Crampton Ball. And so the entire world is watching an FCS kickoff game in Montgomery, Alabama. And if you check Twitter, every single major sports network person was tweeting about how awesome it was to have college football back, which I think in return that if you look on Sunday, if you look at Monday, um, uh, you know, just a few days ago, if you look at that perspective, Kevin, I think these other conferences are starting to panic now because, because the SEC didn't panic. They took their time. They, you know, obviously had their own health experts, but when you have a health expert for one conference, right, for one um, – a part of the country for where all these teams, all these universities are at. And they're saying, look, you can safely do this, right? You can safely practice. You can safely, um, you know, um, uh, sterilize and work out and hit the, and, and, and hit the field. And then you look at these other conferences. I mean, look at the PAC 12. I mean, they acted pretty quick on top of what the big 10 was doing. Obviously the mountain West and, um, you know, at least the Big 12. I mean, the, at least the Big 12 was kind of in the same boat as, a, as the ACC and SEC. But, um, you know, I, I think the other two major conferences really just kind of piggy, you know, uh, piggybacked each other and was like, all right, you, you know, if you do it, I'll do it. And they both kind of acted. And I, I think it was pushing about a month ago. So, I mean, it's pushing some weeks now to when they made that first announcement that we're going to push to the spring. And, and, you know, Kevin, look, I think wholeheartedly that if these conferences do not play in the fall, even if they push it off a couple months, it's going to go into winter uh, sports. It's going to be pushed into that spring category. There is no way from a health per perspective that if you're saying, if it's not safe to play right now, it's not going to be any safer in the spring. You know, I mean, like these health organizations, these health experts will tell you it's 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 not it, it might be better. You know, like maybe there's a vaccine that comes out that's just a miracle worker and just happens. And, you know, hopefully something does happen. But, um, you know, from a leadership perspective, I think the SEC has led it. Um, I think you saw a week ago uh, or not even a week ago that the FCS kickoff classic in Montgomery, Alabama, or those two FCS schools that you can play. You can be safe. Now, I say all that to say that Sunday night, Auburn comes out, Gus Miles on. They have up to 16 players that are going to be out of practice. They had nine positive tests this past week. So, um, you know, I, I think you're going to run into this. I, I think you're going to run into the, to the situations to where, you know, you're going to have one or two guys that give it to, you know, 15, 16 people. And so then you're going to have to kind of slow down practice or at least quarantine those players until you're healthy enough to get out there and play again. Now, I think Auburn's picking up practice again today. And so, um, you know, I, I think the question too kind of runs into it as well. You know, if you have 15, 20 people, you have 15, 20 players that get sick, Kevin, uh, you know, there's no way we can play. Well, I mean, guess what? You, I mean, you got like 70, 80 other guys that you can choose from. So, it's going to be a different outlook of a season. I, I think from a death perspective, Nick Saban keeps talking about, We've got to build depth. Now, he says it every single year, but I think very, very big time this season, you're going to see guys test positive, even if it's a false negative or something happens, and you're going to have to separate him from the team. And, you know, depth-wise, you're going to have to have the next guy step up. Now, from a going-forward standpoint, assuming everything goes forward and the season goes on his plan at the SEC. What do you think is the uh, one or a couple of reasons that 
would pull the plug on this season. And do you think going into the flu season, a, a college football friend should be worried at all? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think if games start up, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty comparable to what high school looks like. I think that if a high school team has an a outbreak, you know, it doesn't matter how many kids, you, you know, I mean, obviously leading up to how many days you have to self-quarantine from and then figure out who that person was around and then they have to quarantine. And so I, I think you're going to see maybe some hiccups here and there to where um, either games are canceled or games are postponed and pushed to the back end of the season or maybe on a bye week. So then, you know, they lose a bye week and then they play that one game that was maybe week three, but they got a bye week, week seven. So then they just move that game to that spot. So I think if the season gets up and it's going to get started, and I think with the FCS kickoff classic, I think college football is definitely going to start. I think there's no doubt in that. So I think once it gets going, if a team has an outbreak, it doesn't matter how many it is, you, you know, if, if, it's, if it's significant enough to where they have to postpone the game, I think they'll absolutely do that. And I think the SEC um, has laid out a really, really good schedule, an in-conference schedule that allows, um, you know, a, a, a couple foreseeable things that would happen in the future. So I, 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 think it's, I think it's highly likely that we see something like that. But I think it's 100% we're going to see a season, especially after two FCS uh, football teams squared off in Crampton Bowl. And do you, we talked about revenues earlier, but do you think with all of the, 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 the kids that are opting out of playing because they're worried about getting the virus or worried about the draft stock, do you think that will affect the quality of college football at all? And how do you think it may impact the upcoming draft? Yeah, you know, college football is good for the country. It's just not good for the SEC. It's just not good for, um, you know, certain teams, certain universities, certain uh, positions across the entire country from west to south. Um, you know, yesterday President Trump calls the – Big Ten Kevin Warren, yeah. calls him, you know, and, and tells him, hey, you know, let's not, let's not make this thing a political thing. You know, it's good for the country. You've got all these other conferences. We've seen college football been practiced safely, played safely on a national scale. Let's get back to this, okay? I think from a revenue perspective is that a lot of these colleges that aren't Power Five, um, you know, I mean, even Troy University, that's a Sun Belt. It's, it's one of the schools that, that we cover. You, you know, I mean, like the Sun Belt is, is, is one of the few conferences. I mean, I think there's maybe five or six conferences that, that are officially said that we're going to play. And so um, from a revenue perspective, I mean, it, it's incredibly important to just not have football for the sanity of people of these states and, you know, fans of these teams, right? Um, but for, for a revenue perspective of the overall sport life, okay? Now, what I mean by that is that you see some of these schools like, um, I think, Bowling Green. I mean, cut, a, a, cut baseball. C cut them early. I mean, like four months ago, cut the program because, because we're not going to have football. You know, so I think across the country from every single conference, you're going to see that if you don't play football, okay, and regardless of what you think about football, if you like it, if you're a fan of it, if you're not, that that money that comes into that university from ticket sales to merchandise, um, you know, from, from just the experience, from um, buying food, from the concession stands, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, in high school terms, it's, it, it's called gate money. You know, I mean, like if these schools don't get gate money, then like how are they going to make it through the next calendar year until we get to football season for the next year? You know, I mean, like how are we going to make it? And so I think it's so important, not just from, again, in a morale standpoint, an insanity standpoint, but to play football 
to keep sports like baseball, soccer, track, track and field. I mean, even bowling, you know, I mean, even some of these other sports that would be so easily cut because the funds aren't there or they're scared about the projections for next year of of what we're going to have revenue wise that if they don't play football, Kevin, you could see a lot of these club sports all the way up to major sports be cut funding. They just don't have the money. It's a revenue driver for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering also if you can handicap for me just just the conference as a whole as the SEC. What are you expecting this season from the conference? Yeah, you know, I I think obviously from this season, you know, I mean, if you look at the SEC, you got to talk LSU, right? I mean, even without Joe Burrow, Chase is opting out. A couple players are transferred. One actually ended up at UAB. Uh, in, in, in Birmingham recently. So, um, it, you know, I mean, like the AP has come out. I mean, it, you know, they've already said what they've got to say about some of these teams. Auburn's in the top 10. Alabama's sitting right there at the top, I think at number three. Um, you know, you got Clemson, uh, Ohio State. So I think if you look at the AP standpoint, I mean, it's kind of funny that they push this out, but I think it's also positive that they went ahead and included a bunch of teams, a bunch of conferences that at this point say that they're not going to play, right? Because it still gives them time, just like the Big Ten, Pac-12 are reevaluating, saying, oh, hold up, you know, we, we, we're we working together to try to get something going. So I think that's incredibly positive on that aspect. But I think, I think from the SEC, um, LSU is definitely going to be down. I mean, I, how far down? I don't know. But losing losing guys, having guys opt out, it's going to be tough. I think Alabama is the clear front. I mean, Bryce Young, Mac, uh, Mac Jones coming back, uh, Najee Harris. I mean, just a stacked defense, a stacked offensive line. Um, uh, I mean, Alabama's got the deepest amount of depth, I think maybe close to LSU or maybe Florida and the entire SEC. So I I think Alabama's going to lead it. You know, obviously, I mean, I just really, really think from a recruiting standpoint, I mean, they have done so, so well and have kept these guys on campus and have pushed guys to the NFL consistently each and every year. These guys reload every season. So, I would look for Alabama to do big things this season. I think Florida's got a really, really good chance coming out of the East. I, I, I think Dan Mullen and, and kind of what he's done over the past couple of seasons to really mold that program, um, you know, to see what he did with pretty much, uh, I mean, not his style of roster, to put it that way, to to run offensively. I mean, they got Trask coming back, so, I mean, that's a – that's a giant plus for them. But, you know, I, I think also Auburn could be a sleeper. I mean, if Auburn can find some consistency in the running game, and, and, and that's – I mean, like Auburn's always been known as a running back style type of university. I mean, you know, I mean, the list could go on and on and on about how many great running backs they got. But this season, they've got Bo Nix. He's coming back for his second year. they got Seth Williams at a wideout. they got a ton of guys to plug. Um, in the slot offensive line has kind of made some changeover from a couple guys. Prince Tega leaves, go, you know, he's playing for the Eagles now. So Auburn could be very interesting defensively. I'm not really sure what hundred percent what they're going to look like, especially on the front. I mean, losing Derek Brown and Marlon Davidson. I mean, it's detrimental, you know, you, when, when you're talking about trying to transition to the following year, but Auburn has done a great job at recruiting they get uh, big cat coming back this year big heck bryant guys incredible player i think defensively they're going to be somewhat of a question mark even in the secondary daniel thomas uh yet drafted by the jaguars so he's no longer there um no inclinogony i mean he's not there either he's playing for the dolphins so a lot of those guys aren't there can they fill those spots we're going to see pretty quickly if auburn can fill those but i think offensively you're going to see a more poised unit offensively for Auburn. But still at the end of the day, Alabama, from a depth perspective, if an outbreak of COVID-19 did happen, Alabama would be the team that I would pick out of the entire SEC that would have have enough depth with just raw talent and raw skill to make up for, for the difference comparable. If Auburn had it, 
or with LSU, even with LSU's depth, they're still losing some guys. Guys are opting out. You're not seeing that for Alabama. You're not seeing it for Auburn. You know, haven't really seen it for Florida. Georgia, is, you know, is another question mark. Can they kind of rebound from another lackluster year of, 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 of so much great hope? Well, I think you're going to see it because Alabama and Georgia is going to play this year. It's, uh, you know, we haven't seen it in – in uh, maybe five, six, seven years or so. So it, it's, it's going to be fun to see all these guys go. I think the in-conference schedule is something that fans have been whining, just complaining to see for years and years. Like, hey, you know, we're tired of playing these cupcake games. Let's add another SEC one or two games to the schedule. Well, well guess what? In 2020, 2021, you're going to get a full in-conference schedule, and you're really going to see what you're made of. You know, I think – Teams like Vanderbilt might not like it. They're probably going to be pretty discouraged by about playing a full SEC schedule. But um, really like Alabama. I like Florida. And if Auburn can somehow uh, figure out to replace some of those holes defensively, I think the offense will be good enough to compete. Puckett also chimed in on the starting quarterback battle in Foxborough with the Patriots between two. SEC alums. Yeah, well, Stidham recently has an injury. You know, I mean, how severe is injury? I mean, told him out of practice a little bit. I mean, I think Cam Newton has been disrespected for a really, really long time. I mean, even back in college. I mean, the guy wins a junior college national championship at Blinn College out in Texas, and then he wins – Obviously, you know, an SEC title, wins an SEC championship, and then he gets MVP, makes it to the Super Bowl, and then what happens, Kevin? He gets destroyed, right? I mean, just doesn't have a good outing, handles the media incredibly poorly. I mean, just really sad kind of how he handled it. But, you know, I mean, Cam kind of has a media presence, kind of like Michael Jordan did. You know, I mean, I've been watching uh, – the last dance and and just kind of living and and kind of going through that. And I would say Newton definitely does have a pretty comparable relationship. I mean, Jordan at one point, I mean, obviously when his dad was murdered, you know, decided to step away. And and really at that point he was kind of done with dealing with the media. Right. So then he goes and plays baseball. um, But then baseball is in kind of a weird position at that time in history. And so then he ends up, you know, working out, coming back, then he wins three more. And, you know, I mean, like the, rest is history but Newton has a lot to prove and I think finally he's in a situation he's got Bill Belichick he's got the weapons around him can Cam work within a system you know I mean that's the biggest criticism that Cam has always had is um, you know he's had he's had head coaches he's had offensive coordinators really tailor stuff around him I don't see Belichick really doing that I mean Belichick is not dumb um, he's, he's incredibly savvy when it comes to hiring the correct personnel to run the style of offense that he wants to run. Can Cam run a type of offense like that? I think he can. But, you know, the quarterback battle, I don't really see it being a quarterback battle. I think Stidham, you know, if he's able to compete, say if Cam got hurt, if he comes in and saves a day, I think it's going to be kind of a Tom Brady situation with Drew Bledsoe that – hey, I'm going to ride with a guy with a hot hand, and then maybe we just don't see Cam again. But if Cam, with this one-year contract, really shows out, gets to a championship game, maybe even Super Bowl, you know, lives up to what that Patriots standard is, I think you're going to see the Patriots reinvest in him for another two to three years, and then it's going to kind of be the Cam Newton show. And I'm wondering also, uh, your thought, you talked earlier about Nick Saban being 668. So I'm wondering also if you can comment on how long uh, you think he still wants to do this. Yeah, well, you know, every single year Saban comes out and he addresses that pretty much in the beginning of the season because it's going to be a question that someone's going to ask him. Being 68, Saban's the youngest 68 I've ever seen in my life. I mean, for a man at 68, for the shape he's in, for the motivation, I I think it's going to be that whenever he does decide to step down and to get out of college and retire, it's going to be a question of passion. You know, I mean, does he have enough passion? I mean, obviously me and you are passionate about our jobs, 
we're both pretty young, you know, in comparison to Saban at 68 and, you know, the accomplishments that he's had. So, you know, if that passion is still there and he still wants to coach, I don't think you're going to see Alabama push him out. You know, I, I think there's no way. I, I think Alabama would actually go in the opposite direction. He makes and, them too much money. Well, no, I, no, I, I, I think Alabama's so invested in Nick Saban, like Nick Saban's invested in Alabama, that if if the Tides stopped winning as much and had a couple six, seven game seasons, five, six, seven game win seasons, I think that's when you see a lot, a lot of push from. Uh, alumni from the board to kind of move in a different direction, maybe go after the Dabo Sweeney that, you know, has been that circling rumor mill that will just never stop. Will Dabo come back to Alabama when Saban's done? Well, I, in my opinion, probably not. I mean, maybe he does, but if, but, but if Alabama is left in the condition of a 6-1 team and Dabo's still Clemson contending for national championships, why would he leave something – so great that he's built that he's proven you come out of the ACC and win a national championship. You can make it to the final four. You can be considered, you can, uh, you know, mold and train these quarterbacks, these great quarterbacks he's had. I mean, Davos had a great track record getting guys in the NFL, just like Saber and Saban or anyone else, you know, if, if you put in comparison. So I think quickly to answer it, when the passion runs out, you know, because once the passion starts coming down because he's not winning, then you're going to get pressure from outside sources, from inside sources as well, pushing to say Saban's had his time. He's made us a staple once again, just like Bear Bryant did. Now it's time to look on. And, and, and But I think for Saban, I think he's too hard-headed. Um, I think he's too intelligent while being hard-headed to let anybody push him out. I mean, he's not going to quit until he's ready. So – I think Saban could coach probably till, you know, 72 to 74, like at this level that he's at. But then again, I'm not Saban. I don't know what his passion level, I don't know what his, his energy level, but um, watching him lead that march on campus uh, for Black Lives Matter the other day, I mean, the guy's incredibly passionate. He loves his players. He loves people. Um he loves what he does, Kevin, and so I don't, <laughs> I don't see him coming out anytime soon. I'm thinking, you know, five years would probably be to where I would think for a guy his age, um, you know, could push it, but we don't know. I mean, Joe Paterno pushed it for a really, really long time, kind of won, kind of didn't. Saban's got high expectations. I think maybe once he sees that I can't compete, I can't build, I can't coach like I want to coach to keep this team on top, then that's probably the moment he'll step away because the passion will naturally leave at that point. That point. And then my final question for you is I'm just wondering uh, what has you most excited about this upcoming college football season and what should we look out for from an entertainment value standpoint? Yeah, Kevin, simple. Just seeing college football, just seeing it happen, man. I mean, just, just having it out there again – um, regardless of what line you, that you stand politically, uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, reaching out to the Big Ten commissioner to convince him, you know, like, hey, let's not make this political. Let's do this for the good. You know, doctors have said we've got experts across the country. All these different conferences are saying we can play safely. If you're going to do it, do it in the fall. You know, I mean, like these teams are still practicing. The morale, okay, the revenue, the benefit to the kids, right? I mean, I don't call them only kids. I mean, they're somewhat grown men, right? And, but, you know, I mean, just for the feel of these universities, of this country, if I had one message for that, it, 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 it would be to keep us together as a country because – I think just from every aspect that you look at, you're going to have some guys get sick, okay? Some guys are going to get sick. But at the end of the day, we, we know enough to quarantine them to, to contain it, right? We've seen it. We've seen it at practices. We've seen it even the high school prep level, okay? Every week for high school schedules for me is a complete nightmare because I've got these teams canceling left and right, rescheduling, playing on Thursday, they're playing a different opponent, they're playing Saturday now. And so, and 
it's because these schools are having a couple kids that are testing positive. So I, I think the most exciting thing for this season is actually seeing college football, just seeing it from your perspective. You can turn on your television, regardless if your beloved Big Ten is playing or not, you can still feel uplifted to enjoy something that you love watching. But more importantly, these men, these young men are doing something that they love, that they want to do. And there's so many more benefits than negatives, I think, that come from this, it's especially from what uh, CDC and all these reports are coming out from the actual percentage of COVID deaths. Because a lot of them, you know, since the pandemic have started, have been tied to basically if you had a other underlying condition, right? So we've been reporting numbers for months. They're actually inaccurate numbers. And that's because the CDC has finally caught up to where they can put more accurate information, have more uh, field of studies, more specialty studies to give us more information. And so, um, you know, it's an, it's an incredibly difficult time for everybody. Just you know, put college football aside, it's tough for everybody. You know, it's tough to, uh, you know, maintain in a business to where, you know, you're a broadcaster and, you know, you're a specialist in what you do, even if you call play by play or if you get on TV or if you do radio. Um, I mean, a lot of people are being laid off. You know, a lot of people are losing their jobs. It's tough for everybody. And even more importantly, people are dying from this. You know, I mean, that, that's incredibly important. I mean, like, that should be at the forefront. Yeah, I know I'm talking, pushing for SEC football and football across the country because it's so many positives. But at the end of the day, you still got to look at the negative side. And that's people are struggling. People have passed away. And so we should do the best we can to keep everyone safe, right, but still play football, still go out there, educate these young men, have people to where, you know, we're able to push the good. Because I think from a national perspective, even from a local perspective, Kevin, even from where you're at, you know, in this world, I mean, we consistently look at more of a negative light because that's what really gets reported more. And I think journalistic integrity, which I, you know, for me is, is my number one characteristic um, in my career is, is my integrity level, you know, telling stories, um, gathering information, how I pitch this story. You know, I'm never going to pitch a story that is going to shed a negative light on someone's reputation. I just, it, it, it's just not me. You know, if, if it comes out and there's a scandal or something, you know, and then obviously you got to report on it. Right. But, but I'm not going to come after the story that that is going to tear up somebody's family, somebody's life. I know a lot of I know a lot of reporters, I know a lot of journalists that they live for that. You know, they've made their name off that. But I think the ones that have stuck around that have been really successful, the likability of them, their journalistic integrity is there. You see it in everything that they do. And so, you know, it's our jobs in this business to promote positive narratives, you know, and, and to not tell the negative side up front every single time. You know, we have to push together to push the positive narrative. And then obviously when the tough questions arise, well, we got to answer them, right? I mean, it's our job to, 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 to inform people of the negative as well. But, um, you know, I, I, just, I just think there's too many people that like seeing themselves on, t on, on television and just like um, getting clicks, you know, it's clickbait. You kind of hear that pop, popped around. There's too many people that want the traction, want the followers, want the views, want the likes, the retweets, the share posts, um, and, you know, love seeing themselves in front of the camera, even though, uh, you know, regardless of what their morale is and, and kind of what their angle is, that's really what the job is. But our job is to tell stories, you know, to tell stories of other people, of athletes, you know, of politicians even, anything and everything. We, if we find the angle, if it's, if it's newsworthy of us pitching a story, it's incredibly paramount. It's incredibly important, Kevin, for us to keep our integrity when we do it. Because again, on the national level, you're seeing a lot of, you know, you see, you see a lot of mud being thrown around, you know, it's nonstop left and right, even in the sports realm. I mean, the Big Ten coming out saying, hey, we're not doing it. 
I mean, everybody hammered him. You know, now I agree that they should have been hammered a little bit, but not to the point that they've gotten up to this point and, you know, challenging the presidents and the universities and from what they've made a collective decision and voted on, you know, I mean, that's their decision to do it. But, um, you know, again, I'm excited for the season. I just hope that we all as journalists, you know, push to promote positivity when we report and when we cover these games, because it's a blessing to cover these games. It's a blessing that we've looked on the back end and it's been stripped from us. Right. It's a blessing for us to even have this conversation right now, you know, Paul Kevin. Yeah, absolutely. You don't, you don't appreciate something until it's gone. Right. So, yeah, definitely. So Daryl, I I just want to uh, take a few minutes and thank you for hanging out with us this morning and talking a little SEC football. Was delighted to see you uh, this morning, and thanks for being here. Yeah, Kevin, you know, I've I've been following your stuff on uh, YouTube, and uh, you've got a lot of really good content out there, man. So I was just excited when I got your email and just came out of the blue. You know, I'm sitting there at a uh, rotary meeting. I checked my email, and, uh, you know, I I see that you want me on your show. And, uh, dude, I, I, again – I'm incredibly appreciative of uh, you reaching out and, you know, thinking that my credibility would uh, give you some good information, give you some good talk points. And, uh, hey, man, I've had a blast. Thank you. Well, me too. And we should do this again. So thanks so much for your time. All right, Kevin. You have a great day, man. Thank you.